started a new series last week called Go. Mackenzie launched it wonderfully with a reminder that God calls us to risk. And that risk she reminded us, even as she challenged us, comforted us with the idea that it's not always risking everything all the time. Sometimes it's even a limited amount of risk that we take in order to be a part of the kingdom of God and the way God calls us to be a part of the kingdom. So in a lot of ways, I think it's worth considering that the word risk is not all that far from the word faith. Mm -hmm. Instead of saying I have faith in Christ, maybe I should say I have risk in Christ because faith means going forward even when you can't be sure. And that's what we're called to do. So the practical reason for this series called Go is that we want to get 100 folks to be willing to be a part of the new uh, City View campus. And uh, we would like you to decide really by the end of the month. Because who is going impacts what we do next as we prepare to go. And so we would love for you to consider going, see how it works, to the City View campus. But with this caveat, you don't stay at Buffalo, which is what we're calling this campus. You don't stay at Buffalo. You go to Buffalo as well. Unless you live here, you are still going. We're <laughs> always going. We don't really get a spot in the Christian faith where we just get static and inert. Mm. Going is a part of what we're called to do. So you will either, I pray, go to San <laughs> or to Buffalo. Because we're going to need people to step up. For the, the most important factor in the success of this venture is God's moving. The second most important factor is our participation, active participation. We have more than enough people to do this. What we don't always have is more than enough people who are committed to the mission of God and the church to do this. So I want to challenge you to do that. We live in a time where uh, one of the difficulties of the modern church is that we are really good at being fed. By that I mean, you know, there's been a shift in the literature lately, away from just talking about the worship of the church, to talking more and more about the discipleship that's necessary in the church. That's a, not a bad shift. I like it. But here's the weakness of it. You can be a disciple and sit in a pew, and sit in a classroom, and sit and read a book, and just be fed all you want. What we need are apostles. Mm. The word disciple means learner. The word apostle means the one who is sent. Mm. And when we get the great commission from Jesus, he says, go, he sends, go into all the world making disciples. So discipleship is the first step to becoming an apostle. And if we stop at being a disciple, we haven't yet fully grasped the gospel of Jesus Christ. Mackenzie highlighted that well for us last week by pointing out that Abraham was sent from Ur to a place he didn't even know. The disciples were sent from Israel into all the world. You and I are sent if we are a part of the kingdom of God. Will you pray with me? God, as we look at your words, your challenge to us in Jesus Christ, we pray that you would open our hearts to what you are saying, open our minds to what you are saying, and help us to be the kind of people who go. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. If you know me at all, you know I grew up in Indiana. I'm not afraid of referencing that. In youth league basketball in Indiana, uh, it's, it's, it's a big part of the culture. And one of the first things you learn in youth league basketball is how to play defense. Well, as we say in Indiana, defense. We don't say defense. We, we, we hit the D really hard. I don't know why. But is how you play defense is a big part of learning to play basketball because you don't just nonchalantly stand as people bring the ball down the court and just wait to see what's going to happen. They teach you to get into what they call a defensive stance. That is the defensive stance, you've seen it before. It's you kind of crouch, you put your weight just a little bit forward, so that on your heels and your butt on your uh, on your the balls of your feet and your heels are still touching the floor. Your feet are a little wider apart than your hips. And uh, you, your feet are facing forward. Put your arms wide so that you can cut down on the passing lanes. 
And that way you can easily shift when the ball comes down and know and be able to respond as quickly and easily as possible. And that doesn't matter to a lot of you. But I tell you all that just to say this. I was not a good scorer. I couldn't hit a basket to save my life. So I loved defense. I could focus on that and do that well. In fact, I, in fact, I became the master on every team I was on, the master of taking the charge. Don't mishear me. I didn't say taking charge. I said taking a charge. And if you're not familiar with basketball, that's what you do when you figure out where the person is going, when they're going to go hard to the hoop. If you get there first, you plant your feet, you're not allowed to protect yourself like with your arms up here or anything. You just have to stand kind of arms to the side and let them hit you and hope a referee calls a foul. <laughs> and the way to be sure the referee will call a foul, this is what I mastered was when you went backward and hit the ground, you made sure your head had a big thump on the other way from That coconut sound, that's all for it every time. <laughs> now that I'm older, I've wondered how much that impacted my personality. <laughs> In a number of ways. The first one being that if you come at me and criticize me, or if I perceive I'm under attack, I immediately, in my mind, get in a defensive stance. Even if I'm going to let you run over me, I tense up and I get ready to get hit. The ministry made it even worse. It didn't help with that at all. If, if you criticize me, just try it right after the service. <laughs> Someone did after the first service. So. You'll see, I just tense up, I just tense up. I won't yell at you. I'm not a yeller, I don't yell. I will never yell back at you. I, I won't attack you, at least not right away. <laughs> what I will do is I will tense up and get ready to get hit. While I'm preaching, I'd like you to think of what your natural tendency is because that happens before I even start thinking about what's going on. That happens the, the seconds too long. That happens the instant I perceive I'm under attack. <clears throat> Other people will respond by attacking themselves, right? Um, I, I don't see many fist fights in the foyer. I'm presuming that most of you don't attack physically, but there are verbal attacks, right? Sarcasm is as handy as leather, leather gloves when you're in an argument. You can attack back in lots of ways. Other people are just really good at deflecting. That's, that's their go-to move. They do a sort of verbal judo and take the force of the attack, deflect it to their coworker or their spouse or their children or their friend or their enemy, and it's someone else's fault. Other people, what they do when they perceive they're under attack, they do what I call, they, they just turn on. They retreat into themselves with self-loathing and hatred. And the reason we do these things and other things besides is because we're trying to protect ourselves. We've learned that doing something like that makes us feel more protected. But here's the thing. Does it? Does it really protect us? I would like us to look at the words of Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount this morning at what Jesus says to do when we feel like we are under attack, when we realize we are under attack. And the Sermon on the Mount is, in, for my money, the second maybe most important stretch of Scripture in all the Bible. I would, I would put it second to like the, the accounts of the death and resurrection of Jesus. Because it's the longest unbroken, unbroken text we have of Jesus teaching us who Jesus is and what the message of Jesus is. When you get to places in the Bible where it says, and Jesus taught them some more, and you go, I wonder what he said right there. Uh, go back to the Sermon on the Mount. Probably it was something like this. This is the longest of broken text, and the problem with the Sermon on the Mount, as important as it is, and as much as we call Jesus Lord, when we get to the sermon, we go, mm, that doesn't work. That's not feasible, Jesus. Mm. That's not how the real world works. So, yes, you're my master and my Lord, and uh, I will do anything you say. I, uh, uh, you, you are, I'll give my life for you, but I won't do this. Mm. And it's because it's hard. But here's the thing. We dismiss it at our own peril. Because it's this teaching that Jesus lived out on the cross. 
and in the resurrection. If we dismiss this teaching of Jesus, it is tantamount to dismissing Jesus himself. So before you hear this text again, and in your heart of hearts get that defensive stance or whatever it might be, understand this is who Jesus is. Chapter 5, verse 38, we pick it up in the middle of the sermon. And here we get the, that saying that if you've never ever been to church, you would still have heard it. The eye for an eye, two for two, and I invite you to open and look at it. It's concerning retaliation it? in terms of the heading that uh, commentators give on it. Verse 38, you have heard that it was said, an eye for an eye and a two for a two. You heard that in the first text this morning, right? That wonderful text from the Old Testament where they delineate everything you've got to do. It's a, it's, it's a very good contract right there. You have to burn foot, burn, foot, 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 hand for hand, eye for eye, tooth for tooth. They are asking the question there, though, that is different than the question Jesus will ask in the Sermon on the Mount. The question they're asking in the Old Testament is, when somebody hurts me, how much can I hurt them back? I, I want to go as far as I can on this. If you love me, I will poke out the eye because I lost my eye. But if you love me, I will also poke out the eye and uh, cut off a fingernail. You know, just a little bit more. Every mobster movie you've ever seen plays in this sort of reality, doesn't it? If they send one of ours to the hospital, we'll send one of theirs to the morgue. And so it ratchets up violence. And so this, this law, which is part of the Old Testament and part of some of the cultures around Israel, this law limits the amount of violence to what was done to you. But that's not the question Jesus is asking. Jesus is asking some, a question that's more like, when I am wronged, how far can I go to share the love of God with that person? It's a very different question, and that's why you get very different answer. So let's look at it again. You have heard that it was said an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I say to you do not resist an evildoer. Wait, 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 wait. Don't reject it just yet. You just heard that do not resist an evildoer. And if you have any sanity at all, you go, well, that doesn't make sense. And part of the reason it doesn't make sense to us is Jesus certainly resisted evildoers, didn't he? He just did it in a different way. So let's be careful about this translation. Grammatically, that is, that is a good translation, but there are other possibilities. And one of the possibilities is that what Jesus is saying there is don't retaliate vengefully by evil means. It's another possible, though not necessary, translation of that text. It's the one I prefer especially when I go to other parts of Scripture. I was taught in seminary to let Scripture expound upon Scripture. When I go to other parts of Scripture and see the same topic talked about, that second translation makes more sense to me. So if you have your Bibles that just flip over to Romans chapter 12, you can see the Apostle Paul talking about a very similar theme. And I'll begin in verse 17. It'll take me just a little bit to get there, but I'll begin in verse 17. Paul says, do not repay anyone evil for evil, but take thought of what is noble in the sight of all. If it is possible, so far as it depends on you, that's an important part, so far as it depends on you, it doesn't always depend on you. Sometimes you can just do what you can do, and then you have to, you have to sort of turn things over, but even in that process, you have a role. You have a role. So far as it depends upon you, live in peace with all. Beloved, never avenge yourselves. Leave room for the wrath of God, for it is written, vengeance is mine. I will repay, says the Lord. No, if your enemy is hungry, and I'm going to insert a word here that's not in your text. If your enemy is hungry, go and feed them. If your enemy is thirsty, go. Give them something to drink. For by doing this, you will heap burning coals on their heads. And the key here is in verse 21. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. That first part of that is really important. Don't be overcome by evil. If you repay evil for evil, suddenly you are overcome by evil. 
You become the monster so the monster won't break you. Paul says that's not what we're called to do. There's a very real sense, a very real context for what Jesus says. That is, when someone mistreats you, when someone abuses you, when someone insults you, you go to them with good in order to overcome evil. Now I know, I know it doesn't work. It's not how the real world works. Unless you are living in a different world. A world of resurrection. I submit to you that the real world is not the one we typically embrace. But Christ, through his resurrection, opened up a whole entire universe that is different from this one. I'm sorry, I said that wrong. This is how this universe really is. Mm. So he gives us these little things to think about in this, and I'm gonna I'm, I'm gonna need a volunteer. Jack, can I get you up here? I used Eli in the service just before this one, so what's good for father is good for son. We get this, if someone slaps you on the cheek, turn the other cheek, and again, <laughs> if, if, <laughs> even if you've never been to church, you've heard that, right? We, uh, <laughs> no, you don't get to slap me, not yet. Um, I'll get really defensive if you <laughs> Let's, let's talk some about the culture in which Jesus was speaking. The left hand was used for unclean things. So you didn't touch people with the left hand. The right hand, is any, that's what you would use. Here are a couple other things to remember. You would never punch someone who was, your, who was less than you. If you punched someone, that meant they were your equal. But you would slap them. So there's a dismissive, less than me quality to a slap. And so if we got the right hand, and Jesus says if someone slaps your right cheek, what kind of a slap is that going to be? It's going to be this, right? Even today, that is more insulting than this, isn't it? And more insulting than this. That is a move to say you are less than me. So Jesus says, turn the other cheek, still right hand, what are my options? Now I can punch him as an equal, but I can't slap him as a less than. Mm. Thank you. <laughs> you. You went and you risked. Thank you. <laughs> what we see here is Jesus calling us to this creative engagement with people who would consider others less than a child of God. And in that process, we remember that they are children of God. And so we don't use evil means in order to respond to what they've done to dismiss us as children of God. It requires creativity. He goes on to say, if someone sues you to uh, take your coat, cloak, give them your coat, give them your cloak as well, just for a little bit of language stuff, your cloak was the outer garment, and uh, the outer garment was super important in that culture because it's how you kept warm at night. And so we have places in the Old Testament where if, if you loan someone money and they give you a, a promise of payment, their cloak, you had to take that back to them at night in order for them to be able to sleep with warmth. And then you could come back and get it the next morning as promise of repayment. So when Jesus mentions that someone sues you to take this, then you also should just give them the shirt off your back. Because that exposes the deed that they're doing, which is dehumanizing for who you are. De-child of Godizing for who you are. Goes on to say the bit about when someone makes you go a mile, go a second mile. Uh, there's some who speculate. It's, it's hard to know what exactly is going on in all this. But one of the speculations is because a Roman soldier can make any person carry his pack a mile, but only a mile, that that would have been an issue of, uh, of an invading force saying you are less than me, carry my pack because I told you to. And then you get to the end of that mile and you continue. Because it's a rule that they, that they can only make you carry it a mile, suddenly they're in a precarious position. 
and suddenly they're finding out what it's like to be in danger of running afoul of an oppressive power. Mm. So all of these things that Jesus mentions, giving when people ask you, all these things are about going to the one who has hurt you and risking. Because you are, it won't always work. It's one of those things where you are taking a risk. And by the way, it's why we need more. It's why we don't just live the Christian faith by ourselves. It's why we're a part of a church. Because you have people who come around you and are a part of showing what this means. People who can help absorb the blow. And so Jesus calls us to do this. And if we want to interpret this super literally, we're going to be off the hook, right? This is, this is why it's important to pay attention to how we read scripture. Has a Roman soldier asked me to carry a pack this week? Did anybody slap you this week? Did anybody sue you for your clothes this week? We've got nothing to worry about in this text, do we? Except Jesus is asking us to think, if I may invent a word, Jesusly, theologically, about how we respond to people who attack us. Mm. And we're called to creatively engage that person and expose ourselves and in the process expose the kingdom of God to the other person. Is there someone on your mind right now? Someone for whom life and Christianity is tough because of the way that person is treating you? What is a creative way to say, I am a child of God and you are a child of God and we are part of the kingdom of God. That's the kind of creativity we have to think through. And the Bible doesn't tell us what to do in every case like that. It just calls us to respond to the power of the Holy Spirit to teach us how to respond to people who attack us. It reminds me so much of a woman I knew in my church in Florida. I've mentioned her in sermons before. When I left that church, I had no idea how much she would stay with me. Pearlene Miller was her name. She was from Nicaragua. She was black. She had married a man from the Barbados and I'm from Jamaica, but they had a ministry in Barbados. They were a part of the Salvation Army. And uh, he did everything for her. She called him Mr. Miller until the day he died. Um, he, paid the, he wrote the checks. She didn't know how to drive, all that stuff. And then, then he died. <coughs> and suddenly she was exposed in a new way. We had to help get her to church. One day at a, a women's event at the church, a car drove up that I didn't recognize, and Pearlene Miller was in the passenger seat. I didn't recognize the driver. Pearlene got out, waved by, and the driver left. And I said, Pearlene, who was that? She said, that was my neighbor. I said, that's awfully nice of her to bring you all the way here, because it was not a short trip. She said, she wasn't always so nice. When I first moved into that neighborhood, I went to each house and knocked on the door and introduced myself. When I got to her house, I knocked on her door and I could see her on the couch. She looked up at me and because I am black, she walked up to the window, grabbed hold of the cord for the blinds and let them fall. I said, Pauline, what did you do? She said, I said to myself, I'll make a friend out of you. <laughs> She did. She did. <clears throat> and that friend was a part of helping her through a very difficult time. You see, when we think we're protecting ourselves, we're separating, usually. We're isolating. We're leaving ourselves more and more exposed because this person did something and that person did something and these people did something. And suddenly we find ourselves alone. This is part of what it means to be the kingdom of God. Mm. To take that risk and go to the one and creatively say, I am a child of God, you are a child of God, and we will treat each other that way. Mm. It won't always work in the way the world says it should work. But ultimately, it's a participation in the world as it really is.